what are your four major numbers? That is first and foremost. This is, this is before I even have a conversation with anyone. This, this applies to people I work with for free, right? When I'm just helping people for free that are in a negative cash flow position, zero paycheck to paycheck, or just very, very low cash flow. And it also applies to people like here on this, on this whiteboard that are making really good money, 37,000 a month, and they're cash flowing over 10,000 plus dollars a month right? Everyone is treated the same. You have to give me your numbers down to the detail, every single number, interest rates, monthly payments, minimum payments, assets, savings, investments, giving, tithing, investments in your business, taxes, liabilities, all of it. The more numbers I have, the better I can do my job, right? So I'm always starting with, with the numbers. So diving into this case study right here, we're looking at a husband and wife, family of five total, so I have three kids, husband and wife. I'm in communication with, with the husband. He is the breadwinner. He's a real estate broker, so he has a, a real estate business, he's got properties, and he also has uh, four coffee shops, right? So he has four brick and mortar businesses, and he's actually in the process of establishing a fifth one. So this is a person that is making very good money, right? They're doing multiple millions per year, and this is what they pay themselves, right? So between himself and wife, they both work in the business, and they pay themselves $37,033 $33 a month. Now, that number has and will increase as him and I are working together. So I'm just showing you this was like the origin numbers. This is where we first started, and this is their cost of living on the personal side. All right, so 25,140 is what they spend per month to run their personal operation along with their debts that they have. Majority of their debt is on the personal side. So they have $2.7 million worth of debt. And so when you minus the total income from expenses, we're rocking at around $11,893. What are your financial goals. What are you trying to solve for when you're on the internet researching things, when you're watching videos? Where does your mind typically go when it comes to money? Are you more so, how do I simply make more money? How do I create a gap between what I make and what I spend? Or does your mind go to, how do I get rid of this debt, get rid of this stress? Right? How do I just spend less than what I already make? How do I, how do I keep more of the dollars I already make. Where does your mind go? Go ahead and, and comment that for me. When you're joining webinars like this and, and anything that has to do with finances, what's your goal? What's your financial goal? What are you trying to solve for? These are key questions that I will also ask in addition to getting the numbers. The numbers just gives me a foundation, a framework in terms of what to work with, what I'm dealing with, right? So I'm dealing with a high income earner. I'm dealing with a business owner. I'm dealing with someone that has a high lifestyle, high expense lifestyle, more than your average American, right? Most Americans across the United States are only making, say, sixty to 70000 a year, right? It's the average. And then when you break it down into different minority groups, you'll get into lower 40s, lower 50s. If you're a single mom, typically you're doing about maybe 40, 50K a year. If you're a single dad, maybe you're like in the maybe mid 50s and 60s. Right. So what are you solving for? What are you solving for? So for Farah Malik says how to make more money. OK, Seth says no debt first, then build from there. Right. So notice how between just two people right now, between Seth and Farah, the first intent, one says I need to make more money. So we're trying to increase the gap. What's the gap? The gap is the cash flow between what you make and what you spend. Right. So if this is how much you spend per month, and all you did was increase the gap, make more money, guess what? You're gonna have way more cash flow to work with than the person that says, well, I need to pay off debt first. So maybe they make this much and they have a small gap and they're like, well, if I reduce my cost of living, that's how I increase my gap. So Seth is thinking bottom line, Farah is thinking top line, which one's right? They're both right according to their intention. What are they trying to solve for? That's what I'm doing when I'm running numbers like this. Give me the baseline, give me the numbers, give me your intent, I solve for that. And then, based on our relationship together, how we work together, whether it's on a paid or, or not paid or free or just interaction like this, over time, you begin to learn some of the financial 
quote unquote philosophies or financial strategies that can help solve for either one top line, bottom line, or maybe you're someone that is like both. Well, how can I make more money and pay off debt at the same time? So in this particular case study, this person is definitely a top line guy. He's like, dude, I, I'm all about increasing my value in the marketplace to get paid abundantly. But I also recognize I have a lot of debt on me right now. So I just want to make sure that the money that is coming in, that I'm managing it and stewarding it correctly, and that I'm getting the most out of my net discretionary income, cash flow. So where velocity banking comes in is how we improve the flow. Okay, Velocity banking is, is essentially increasing the velocity of money, the speed and direction of what, how your money flows and how it moves. Right? Most people that I meet, their money flows like this. They get paid. You're either in one of these four quadrants, or maybe you're in all of them, but you're either an employee, a self-employed, you're a business owner, you're an investor. You're one of these four things. So you receive money from doing a service, doing a job, committing, completing task. Once you get paid, where does it land? It lands in a checking account. Then from there, you pay bills. After you pay bills, there's cash flow. That cash flow, you typically, most people will see their cash flow at the end of the month, and that's where they decide whether I'm going to save that cash flow in a savings account, or if I'm gonna invest that cash flow in my 401k, in my Roth, in my HSA, in my brokerage account, wherever. They spend it, you blow it, because you saw the money there, it was there, you paid all your bills, oh, I got extra money, let me go blow it. That's how most people operate. So with velocity banking, this creates a layer where we can get extremely disciplined. This does require discipline to successfully do this kind of a strategy. And so when I'm meeting with people, I'm figuring out where their level of financial literacy is at, their, their discipline, et cetera, et cetera. And that will help me kind of guide the conversation, really understand how, how they operate. So again, after you, you know, money hits your checking account, you pay bills, you got money left over, you're either going to save that cash flow, you're either going to invest it, you're going to spend it, waste it, or you're going to pay off more bills, like pay off debt. Well, what if there was a way to speed up any one of these things? That, that you would do. And instead of using just what's left over at the end of the month, what if we could use 100% of what you make to solve for any one of these things, whether it's paying off debt, whether it's saving or investing, right? What if there was a way to do that? And it really involves this piece here, where money resides. Where does your money stay parked before it pays a bill, before it's saved, before it's invested, before it's spent. Where does that money sit? And that's what we want to figure out. If we can solve for that, velocity banking is going to click. The, the light bulb's going to go off, right? Now, what helps to know is when money sits in a checking account, for the most part, I understand there's checking accounts out there that do pay a dividend, right? They pay a rate of return on the money that sits in the checking account. I get that. But for the most part, you're not earning anything when money is sitting parked doing nothing, not earning anything. If you were to put that money in a location where it could earn and simultaneously get multiple uses from the same dollar, then we might be onto something in terms of what we can solve for and how quickly we can solve for these things. I think a lot of people in this day and age, we're, we're really in the instant gratification phase. We are in the get here, get it here, get it now, pay later type of mentality where what I'm thinking, again, I'm, I'm 27, I don't know everything, right? I'm no expert by any means. But what I am figuring out is what if there's a financial strategy that could solve for getting rich fast, efficiently, but then also getting rich slow? Like how do we create wealth quickly by providing value in the marketplace and getting paid abundantly for that, and then creating wealth slowly in terms of stewardship, how do we steward the money that does come in when you when you increase your top line? Because one of the most things I see all the time, right, not to call out Farah, but what happens, Farah and many others, we make more money, guess what happens to our expenses? It goes right with it. It's almost inevitable. In fact, you can't avoid it. You can't actually maintain your expenses year over year over year. It's impossible. Why? We have a thing called inflation. So inflation alone and taxation 
will increase your cost of living as well as finance charges. So those are like the three main areas of your life, finance charges and taxes. We can figure out how to reduce that even though cost of living will increase. I think we can have a nice recipe here where yes, focusing on providing value in the marketplace according to our skills, gifts, and talents, fulfilling our purpose in life, getting paid and abundantly, then stewarding that money and then putting it in cash flow vehicles that can speed up, stay ahead of these different things like inflation, taxation, devaluation of the currency and that, and that such. So I won't go that deep into it. What I want to do now, uh, I gave you the a, a bit of a, a framework here, gave you the numbers. I'm going to go into what we're dealing with in this particular case study with the $2.7 million of debt, we have a, within that debt, we have a home equity line of credit, which are one of the tools that we could replace as our checking account. So this could be replaced. So when I'm working with folks, I'm thinking, how can I replace their dead checking account? It's not really doing much for them. And we want to increase velocity. So it's a combination of replacing your checking account with a tool that comes with capital, preferably, right? Comes with capital that we can leverage. So replace and leverage, the two key ingredients here. If we can learn how to leverage what we replaced as our checking account, then we're gonna be able to speed this up extremely fast. So in this example here, we got a home equity line of credit in the second position on their primary mortgage. Their primary mortgage is $1.9 million. Their mortgage payments, 11, almost $12,000 a month. Interest rate, 5.75%. We have what's called another tool here, what's called a cash value, collateral line of credit. Someone put that in the comment. Write that out for everyone. Cash value collateral line of credit. It's also known as a life insurance line of credit. So this individual here has three life insurance policies two on himself, one on wife. So what he is doing is he is saving money. Prior to meeting me, he makes money, goes to a checking account in the business, and then he distributes from the business to the personal. Money lands in his personal. He pays $25,000 worth of expenses. This money is left over. He then sends that money, a portion of it, each and every month to a couple of different life insurance policies. So instead of saving his money at the bank, earning a small rate of return, which he'll have to pay taxes on, he decided to move that money into cash value life insurance. Or in other words, something called WLI, whole life insurance. So he has three of them and he's making this much money, right? Spending cash flowing, great. He's been doing that for a couple of years. And what happens is while you're funding these whole life insurance policies, once you get to a certain amount of what's called cash value, which is a living benefit, this cash value, you can approach a bank and get a cash value collateral line of credit. So that's what this gentleman did. So he got a line of credit for 253,000 being the credit limit. When we first met, start working together, this is fresh in my mind. So we just started working together about a little, about a month now. So a month ago was like when we started working together. So he started off owing $250,000 on his what? Cash value collateral line of credit. The interest rate was not at 8% originally. It was a little bit uh, lesser to begin with. It's been increasing over the years, but that is the current rate right now, 8%. And it was 7.75% on his HELOC. I believe that also increased a little bit, but I'm just going to say 7.75 for now. And on his HELOC, he owes 196,000 bucks. So we have a lot of debt everywhere. We got another tool this is on the business side. It's called a business line of credit. Owes 8,759 bucks. The monthly payment's $2,200. That should fall off in a couple of months. That'll be done. But he's got a lot of leverage in terms of utilization debt. Nearly maxed out on our HELOC, near, maxed out nearly on our cash value line of credit. We've got debt on a line of credit here. We got a huge mortgage, $1.9 million. And by the way, we have many other debts. We have car debts and all this other stuff going on, student loan debt. So I didn't even put everything on here, but there's a lot. So he's dishing out large payments each and every month to these different things, large payments. Again, money comes in, hits the checking account, pays bills, there's cash flow. He'll save, invest, and spend. So what I'm trying to do is get all of this going to one location. I want someone to put in the chat, cash flow together is stronger than when separated. I want you to write that. Someone put that in the chat for me. That's a little gem you can take away with. When cash flow is together, 
right, and I apply it to one location, whatever I do in that location is going to work more efficiently because there's simply more to work with. Most of us, when we have all these different debts going on, we send a little extra money here, a couple extra hundred dollars here, a couple extra hundred dollars here, a couple extra hundred dollars there. What's happening is you're sending your cash flow to die in interest and finance charges. Your money is just simply going to die little by little, little by little. And you never see that money again. Versus if you could centralize where all your money goes and then attack one thing at a time, then once you've maximized that area, you're going to get an overflow. That overflow can go into the next thing that you would then attack, right? And this works very well in the world of business. I mean, there's, there's entrepreneurs, there's business owners, there's solopreneurs, and quite often we see on the internet how to establish seven different streams of income, right? Seven different, different streams. Well, what I see a lot of people do is they'll go start one stream, then they invest in this company, get a second stream going, then they'll take some money and then they'll put it in a third stream. Before you know it, yes, they have seven streams that they've established, but they can only put so much effort into each one of those streams to fully maximize it versus the person that takes all of their effort and energy and focuses on their main thing, their core offer, fully maximize that until there's overflow, until your cup overflows and guess what? You can flow it into the next stream and then that stream runs parallel with the first stream. Works the same way with paying off debt and maximizing your finances. So how do we centralize that $37,000 that's coming in into his economy? How do we centralize that and then disperse the funds to where it needs to go? That's You get that. If that clicks for you, my goodness, you're going to be running your finances very, very efficiently. So here's what happened in literally like 30 days, right? Went from owing 250,000. We got it down to 238 so far on his cash value line of credit. What we're in the process of is literally moving all this money instead of it hitting the checking account, which it naturally will. He'll, he'll, he'll transfer money from his business to his personal checking account on a weekly basis. Before a dollar gets spent out of that checking account, he's depositing all of the income into the line of credit directly in there. What does that do in terms of what we pay in interest? that dramatically will reduce my cost of borrowing on that line of credit. So this 8% is not gonna feel like 8%. It's gonna feel like less than four. Who right now in 2023 is borrowing at 4% on their debt? Almost no one. Everyone has high interest car loans and high interest credit cards, and they're locking in six, seven, almost 8% mortgages now. Like rates are extremely high in 2023, right? And they're, they're consistently going up. It might go up again. So to be able to borrow in an environment at a very, very low interest cost, to be able to literally offset your borrowing costs is a game changer, a game changer. So here's what's happening. When they generate money from the business and the real estate and the rental income and his different streams getting deposited right into his cash value line of credit. Now we could have done it with the HELOC, right? Could have done that. The reason why we chose the cash value collateral line of credit is what's really unique about that is the whole life insurance contracts themselves are earning, he's in the first couple of years, so I'm gonna assume he's somewhere around here. He's earning about a two to 4% internal rate of return on his three life insurance policies, right? Might be, a, it might not be nowhere near 4%, so I would probably say around like two, right? And this is a, a compounded guaranteed rate of return that's tax-free and liquid that's earning on the money that he collateralized with the bank. So the bank said, yeah, okay, you've got over $250,000 in total cash value in, in his different policies. And he used, I think, one or two of them. I think we used about two policies, got a collateral assignment with the bank, and then the bank gave us more money, $250,000, $253,000 line at this 8% rate. But what happens is the cash value component, his money is, is uninterrupted. It's going to keep growing as if he never borrowed the funds. So he's got the same money growing at a tax-free compounded rate that will be guaranteed for his whole entire life. Meanwhile, the bank is charging him a rate based on whatever amount of interest that he uses, right? Whatever amount that we leverage. Well, then the question becomes, well, how do I offset that then? How do I pay as little interest as possible, creating what 
the term is typically called like a positive arbitrage or an offset. In order to solve for that or maximize that, most people again would just think, well, let me just send all my cash flow, you know, into that, right? And then I'll pull from it. And it's like, well, why not just send all this and then some? So you deposit it all into there, right? 238,000, right? And over the course of 30 days, $37,033 will go in. So the balance will, will drop to here, being the lowest. And then throughout the month, we have expenses, $25,140 worth of expenses. Now here's what happens. His expense is actually going to decrease the moment he starts this. Reason being is the life insurance line of credit itself has what's called an interest only payment. So when he first started working with me, oh, 253,000, you times that by 8% and divide by 12, he has an interest only payment for however long he owes 253,000 of $1,686.66. Just goes to interest, okay? That's a lot of interest on owing 253. The moment I dump my income in, this number is gonna reduce for the month. So I want you to remember that number right there, and we're gonna run math on how much interest we actually pay in the, in the first month of doing velocity banking in comparison to what we pay here. If we would have just been paying the monthly interest over here, and then we're sending our cash flow wherever, right? Oh, let me just pay a little on my, let me pay a little bit more on my house. My house is killing me. Oh, let me pay a little more here. You know, that credit card's killing me. Let me, let me throw a couple of bucks over here at my HELOC. That's killing me. It's like, let's reroute it all back to the line. 200,000, 967, 200,000, whoops, one, two zeros, 967, plus 25,140. So at the end of one month, balance went down, went up, will coast out, it'll go up and down throughout the month, and then it'll end somewhere around this number, 226,107. Now let's figure out the interest cost. How do you figure out the interest cost on a revolving line of credit where the interest is calculated daily based on what you owe on a daily basis? So what I'm gonna show you is a very overestimated way of calculating the interest. Mind you, the number that I'm gonna show you is not actually what we will pay. It's gonna be a lesser number, and there's gonna be a second component that I'll add that'll make this look even prettier in terms of what we pay in net interest, right? We would take the starting balance of 238,000, times that by 8%, and you divide it by 365. So that would be $52.16. $52.16. 238, if I just paid the interest for that month, right? We went from 1686 on 253 on 238, it would be here. So this is a more accurate number to use for that month, the month that we're in right now in 2023. So that's more of an accurate number, right? 1586.66. 52.16 per day for however long I owe 238. Here's what's interesting. Will I ever owe 238 for more than a day? If I'm dumping all my income in, the moment money comes in? The answer would be no, but I'm still just going to create that overestimation here. I'm gonna take that number of income going in, total amount of income that went into the line. I'm gonna use that number, the 200,967 times 8%, divide by 365, that's $44.04. Four and I'm gonna take that number, the ending balance, starting, low balance, ending balance, 226,107 times 8%, divided by 365, $49.55. Here's what you do. You add up those three numbers now, 4404 and 5216. You divide by three and you times it by 30 days. You pay $1,457.57 in interest. So that went to the bank. So they got their win. Okay. Here's how we get ours. Number one, I already reduced interest costs. Here's the second component. Second component which would be a credit card, out of this 25,140, I'd be willing to bet that he'll probably have a good seven to 9,000, maybe more dollars expenses that we could run on a credit card with no additional cost to do so. It's your food, gas, miscellaneous, car insurance, phone bills, subscriptions, et cetera, et cetera, entertainment, eating out, gas, everything. Anything and everything that we can run on a credit card and get cash back rewards. Someone with that kind of income, with great credit, no doubt in my mind, they could probably be earning about two to 3% cash back rewards. So I'll lowball it, call it 2%. I'll use a low number. Say $7,000 a month times 2% in cash back rewards. That's $140 in cash back rewards for running 
bills through a credit card. Now here's what's interesting. This number right here of money coming out of the line of credit within that 30 days, it's no longer 25,140. It's 25,140 minus, let's just say 7,000 bucks. So for about a 20, 25 day cycle, 7,000 more dollars will stay in the line of credit, reducing the balance, reducing the interest costs. That's dollars and cents back into my economy that I will pay less. Meanwhile, that expense of seven to 9,000 sat in a credit card for about a 20 to 25 day cycle until it is due the following month. And then it'll come out of the line of credit. So I saved interest costs over here, a couple dollars there. So it's gonna reduce that number. I earned $140, so it's gonna reduce that number there. And then pour the gravy on top, come back to this whole life insurance contract here, where let's say I'm earning 1.2%, right? In the year that you're like, understand that in the first couple of years, you're really not earning a whole lot. And sometimes it's, it's definitely like a negative rate of return the first one or two years. Once you get past the most expensive years, which is the first two years, then like years three, four, which I think they're in year three, then you start to earn like point-ish percent, maybe year four, year five, depending on how it's designed. So I'm gonna use a 1.2% return on 200 and I think it was 600, I think it was 265K in cash value that, that he had. Um, let me, uh, let me take questions right as I get done, it, or if you could type it, I will gladly answer that question for you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive right in. So on 265,000, let's just times it by 1%, that's $2,650 that got earned inside of the policy. That's for the year though, right? Just for the year on 265,000, 1%. That's what it grew by for the whole entire year. So that also helps with what my interest costs would be on this cash value line of credit. So just understand that, are we paying interest? Yes. How much interest are we paying? Much less than the alternative of just making extra payments to the different debts that I have. The third component here. So first component is replace my checking account with a tool, something I could leverage. Could be a HELOC, could be a credit card, could be a line of credit, could be a first lien HELOC, could be a cash value line of credit. In this case, we're using a cash value collateral line of credit. What does it require? Well, it does require a whole life insurance policy to get it in the first place. You have to fund it for a couple of years to build the money up in order to approach the bank and they'll be willing to collateralize that money. So we did that. Second component, you attach a credit card to what we're doing to reduce interest costs, park money in a 0% location, floating interest month to month, getting cash back rewards, and also credit cards offer statement credits where you can earn anywhere from as little as $100 to as much as like $700 just by running bills on the credit cards. So that's more money back in your economy to help offset your borrowing costs. Last component here is the actual doing of Velocity Bank, where you just dump money in to your line of credit. That's now your checking account. When bills are due, guess what? You withdraw money out of your line of credit back to your what? Your checking account. And your checking account simply pays bills. There is a way to create a bit of a sweep function here where you can do what's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, overdraft protection, right? You can create overdraft protection, which simply would pull money automatically out of your line to pay your bills when the bills are due. So you'll see your checking account go negative, right? You could do that. I personally don't. I still, I don't know, I'm weird. Like I understand that I'm, that I could be saving money or saving interest by doing that. I just choose not to, even though I have overdraft protection on my cash value line of credit, I simply move money the day before bills are due or typically every three to five days. I will pull money out of my line of credit, goes to my checking account, my checking account pays all my bills. Meanwhile, 100% of my cash flow is principal pay down to my debt. That's the key here. Every single dollar that goes into my line is principal. And then on the due date of the line of credit itself is where they'll pull interest. And guess where they pull interest from? They pull it from here. So I don't even have to make a payment. They just pull it from the equity, the available credit. That's beautiful. And so my goal is to just simply reduce what they take out of it, right? And I can show you proof. Like I have a cash value line of credit myself. In my first month of doing Velocity Banking, owing, it was like over $60,000 or so. I paid like $200 in interest. And when you run the math, 
it's like a 1% cost. So you can do a, a, a lot with this, be, be very, very efficient. And again, that last component is just simply now doing it. Once we've started a flow of velocity banking, this, this balance is gonna reduce. Like notice how it went down to 226, then you add the interest. In a couple of months, we're getting that thing below 100. My goal for the client would be to take the available credit, I times it by 66%, So look, we wanna to get to this number. I wanna to get to 166K or less, create space in my line of credit, and then I can start doing things in terms of, okay, what do we wanna push debt over here, right? and push it into the line. So that could be our HELOC. We could push our HELOC. This person has car loans. We can push car loans. We can push student loans. We can push his mortgage, right, in chunks over time into this line where I pay virtually very, very little in interest costs. Whatever I do pay, I'm creating an offset because it was the same interest I was paying over here. If I move that payment, right, imagine moving this payment into here and he could do that over the years, right? So the mortgage would be like the last thing that we would pay off but we could move that HELOC that he owes 196 on where he's getting tore up in interest. Once we get this line of credit paid down, then we'll just take that cash flow, pull it out of the HELOC, put the zero, HELOC to zero, move it in here, pay a much le less, lesser uh, interest costs. And then like Farah, who wants to make more money, he can keep working on that. Keep increasing the top line. Spend less than what you make, manage your money right, create stewardship, and go from there.